so much, Anna. And I also wanted to say I'm incredibly honored to be here. Um, this lecture series is one that I've uh, admired for years and years, and I've always wanted to be a part of it. So this is really a, a dream come true for me. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's been hosting me. Um, I'm so grateful for the kind and warm reception. And um, it's just been a lovely experience so far. So thank you. Uh, the talk that I'm delivering today, An Unstable and Fantastical Space of Absence, The Entanglement of Memory and Emotion, is part of a book project I'm working on. The book is titled Crip Space Time. I'm still working out some of these ideas, so I'm welcome, oh, I welcome feedback of all kinds. Um, suggestions, connections, questions, um, anything you can think of that would be aimed at helping me think through these ideas better. So this is very much still um, a series of thoughts in progress. Uh, I'm also happy to talk more about things that I have to mention fairly quickly in this talk. Um, for example, the methodology and theoretical framework underlying the interview study that um, I'm drawing upon, um, or what we've learned from other interviewees, aside from the few that I'm able to mention um, in this relatively brief paper. And I also should ask, because I forgot to ask, uh, what time does this uh, typically wrap up? Um, maybe about talk for about 40 minutes or so. Okay, great. And I will have time for questions. Great. I will keep an eye on my watch then. Um, I'm, I'm good at speeding up as I draw near the end of a paper. <laughs> um, so to begin, here are some things that have been said to me about my memory in the context of the academic workplace. Oh, I can't remember names either. You've met me. We've met. But you have a great memory. It's disrespectful not to learn your students' names within the first two weeks. Name tags? Are you serious? Uh, that comment was actually published on an article I wrote that was published in um, Inside Higher Education. So it was, it was especially um, exciting to have someone question that um, in print. Oh, Margaret knows me. We know each other. I know you. Um, these things are not said in an effort to brush off or minimize my difficulties with both short and long-term memory. In some cases, I think they're said in an effort at connection. For example, empathizing with the difficulty remembering people's names by saying, oh, I'm terrible with names too. When I mention my own memory impairment directly, it rarely fails to inspire another person to share stories of their own, especially its failings and quirks. In other cases, the interlocutors may feel hurt or as if they've been brushed off. This is one of the profound entanglements of memory and emotion. When we fail to remember others or fail to remember important things, it's often hurtful. It can seem careless or rude. In other contexts, it can seem downright hostile, sexist or racist, a display of power. It's interesting to me that we tend to take memory personally. Memory dwells close to how we value ourselves and value others, sometimes to an extreme degree. It's common, for example, to declare that if a person can no longer remember their own lives or remember their loved ones, for example, in the case of dementia or brain injury, they are often said to be, quote, no longer themselves. A comment form about Alzheimer's disease that I was reading recently included the declaration by a daughter that she did not feel upset about her mother's oncoming death because as far as the daughter was concerned, her mother had died when she could no longer remember who her daughter was. Only rarely does another person get a close look at how my memory actually works for the simple reason that it cannot be understood accurately in moments, but only over a stretch of time and only by interacting with me in various contexts. Sometimes I display amazing feats of memory other times, I can't retain information well enough to follow a simple conversation. <laughs> I'll just add here off the cuff that it um, was a very meta feeling to be having lunch with three people I had newly met, all of whom I communicated with by email, one of whom it turns out I worked with on an academic project, <laughs> um, and to be talking about um, my forthcoming pa this paper while also um, sort of performing my usual mental gymnastics to try to remember all this stuff and to, to learn of exciting surprises, such as past relationships. <laughs> um, I, it also gave me a tremendous sense of relaxation, like, oh, well, that's what I'm here to talk about. So <laughs> that's why I keep calling the, um, the 
security lodge the guard station. <laughs> I, I don't know why in my mind is decided that's called the guard station, so I keep saying that on the phone, which is awkward because my luggage was lost, and that's where they're supposed to be bringing the luggage. <laughs> so that, that's a small example of the way things work and these things work in everyday life. Um, in this paper, I'll be looking first at the ways that memory is entangled with emotion. And I'm arguing that one of the reasons for this entanglement, perhaps the key reason, is that memory is also entangled with rhetoric, and particularly the phenomenon of rhetoricity, which I'll explain further in a bit. I then argue that this emotional entanglement is not unique to memory and its frailties, but actually attaches to all body minds that, in the words of Fiona Kumari Campbell, quote, ooze or are leaky, especially those that are fat, distressed, sick, dying, addicted, or appear impermanent, end quote. I then present data from an interview study with 34 disabled faculty members, focusing especially on those whose disabilities match this description of leakiness and impermanence. This is a state that Andrew Harnish has characterized as, quote, obscure. By exploring those obscure conditions of disablement in detail, I'm fleshing out a theory I've been working on of crip space-time. Crip space-time, to define it very briefly, describes the ways that we, as disabled people, move through and manifest in space and time. These ways of moving demonstrate that for us, space-time is not just different, not just expanded, but in some cases, to borrow Alison Kafer's term, exploded. In other words, in some cases, when disability is centered, space-time becomes something radically different. A difference not only in degree, but also in kind. So um, the first section that I'm sort of, where I'm diving deep into a concept is um, a kind of review of um, memory and um, how it's understood in rhetorical terms. Memory, according to classical rhetoricians, was the fourth canon of rhetoric along with invention, arrangement, style, and delivery. Present-day rhetoricians who take up the topic of memory often note that it is rather neglected in comparison to the other four canons. An exception, however, is those who deal with public memory, that is, ways that cultures, communities, and groups remember things together. Public memory refers to everything from deliberate memorials, such as a war memorial erected in a public square, to the shared traumas of war or centuries of oppression, which may be memorialized through rhetorical acts such as songs, rituals, forms of language, and even, some would argue, genetic marks that are carried through generations. This controversial theory is called epigenetics. In his study of public memory, Kendall Phillips notes that the important distinction between forgetting and the different act of misremembering or remembering differently originates, he argues, with Plato. Unsurprisingly, Plato was suspicious of misremembering, mis thinking of it as, we're not to that quote yet. Unsurprisingly, <laughs> Plato was, was suspicious of misremembering, thinking of it as deception, since he tended to think that we should all share essential knowledge in some way. Similarly, Aristotle pointed to the dangers of remembering differently, a concern that led him to separate memory the classical Greek for that is neme, from recollection. The classical Greek for that is an, anam, ne, anamnesis, um, which of course is the root for words like amnesia. As Phillips points out, this fear surrounding the act of remembering differently is anchored in the long-standing fear of people whose minds work in ways that deviate from the cultural norm. Phillips explains, it is this concern for reasserting the potential for human, read, rational, agency to control the appearance of memories that leads Aristotle to distinguish memory from recollection, as recollection becomes a disciplined structure for containing and directing the unbidden and potentially disruptive effects of memories. Despite these fears, later rhetoricians, including Phillips himself, suggest that this remembering differently opens a way to consider the value of different knowledges as they are applied to the same situation. Phillips refers to memory as, quote, an unstable and fantastical space of absence, quote, an instability that distressed Plato and Aristotle, and which contemporary reactions to unstable memory suggest we continue to feel distressed about, 
By contrast, Phillips suggests, we could understand the mutability of memory as something that enables creative acts of composing. For example, a culture shaping of public memories in ways that help sustain it, so that their experience of the past is cultivated and contained. I just want to check in and ask if anyone's feeling concerned about that noise. I am. Okay, should, should, we, should we see what it is I before? I don't, I don't think we... We probably it's can't do anything that I think it. it is. It, it happens and then it goes away. Okay. That's, that's my professional approach. I'll, I'll just put it in our collective public memory then, <laughs> um, so that we can cultivate and contain a reaction to it, which is to, <coughs> to ignore it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's <just> magic. <laughs> Phillips is an exception among contemporary rhetoricians because of his interest in memory. I've quoted him at some length because he explains so beautifully the fears that surround the instability of memory. And that he points out that those fears have been with us for thousands of years. Um, however, it's not within the scope of um, Phillips' rhetorical review to explain why memory gets so little attention in comparison to the other four canons of rhetoric. As I've delved more deeply into the connections between memory and emotion, I've begun to wonder whether the reason that both classical and modern rhetoric tend to ignore memory is that they also tend to posit an abled body. Memory is terribly interesting if you're thinking from the point of view of a person with traumatic brain injury, for example, or a learning difference. However, if you tend to assume that all minds work in essentially the same way, memory becomes much less interesting because in that case, the mind is imagined as something to a computer or a library. The information is there, it's just a matter of finding the right folder or the right shelf. And it was the very quality of memory to reveal the instability of the human mind that made Plato and Aristotle so nervous about it and um, led them to create various categories. As you probably know, Aristotle really loved categories. Um, various categories to try to contain the different kinds of memory and to try to separate the safe, rational memories from the more disruptive, explosive forms of memory. So, given this interesting entanglement between disability, memory, emotion, and rhetoric, it's not surprising that rhetoricians who deal with disability have uncovered some of the most interesting connections between memory and emotion. For example, in the special issue of the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies that focuses on emotion, Janelle Johnson published a close study of lobotomy that suggests that such brain injuries are transformed rhetorically into what she calls emotional impairment. And she says this, As emotion is medicalized, old binaries and hierarchies, reason slash emotion, weak emotion slash strong emotion, negative emotion slash positive emotion, are subsumed under the dominant medical binary of normal slash pathological. An intense emotion, negative emotion, and to a certain extent emotion itself became characterized as impairments to be remedied by medical intervention. In other words, as she investigates the rhetorical history of lobotomy, Johnson finds that emotion itself seems to become a medical issue, one to be regulated through medical discourses and processes. As her article and her later book demonstrate, this regulation involves ongoing efforts at containment, especially for those in groups such as women, people of color, poor people, disabled people, and those in what we now call the Global South. Johnson connects this abhorrence of emotion to rhetoricity. Rhetoricity, first defined by Cynthia Lewicki Wilson and Catherine Prendergast, involves the ability to participate in the world as a subject one whose point of view is respected, and whose experiences are not co-opted into narratives such as just being crazy. As I glossed in my book, Mad at School, rhetoricity is the ability to be received as a valid subject. In that way, interestingly, rhetoricity is also inevitably an interactional quality. You can't really go around in the world and be like, I have rhetoricity. Rhetoricity only manifests through <coughs> interactions, through the ways that rhetorical acts are not only offered, but also taken up. Um, and this is part of what's important to me about Crip Space Time. For me, it's fundamentally not about the individual or ways that disability might sort of be, quote unquote, in body minds, but ways that disability manifests when we recognize that intraactivity is always manifesting 
um, certain bodies and minds in particular ways. And I'm getting that term intra-activity from Karen Barad. What I take from all this is that the entanglement of memory and emotion points us in a specific direction. Namely, the recognition that emotion often seems to be used as a means to sort the valid um, from the invalid, or invalid, subjects. I'm now going to turn in a somewhat different direction and talk about how my study of memory actually led me to broaden out from memory itself and to start thinking about a wider um, range of invalid subjects and how this invalidity manifested in space-time. Memory, as I've discovered, is only one of a variety of human capacities whose absence or impairment is strangely difficult to explain as an impairment. I've come to think of these as obscure disabilities, and as I mentioned, when I do that, I'm following the work of Andrew Harnish, um, H-A-R-N-I-S-H. I don't think he's published that concept yet. I heard him talk about it at the Disability Arts Health Conference in Bergen, Norway, and I was immediately just captivated by it. I've been talking and thinking for a long time about disabilities that are just, that people never seem to get <laughs> um, in various ways, the disabilities that are not taken up rhetorically, disabilities that are turned into other things, um, you know, that in some way disabilities that seem to often be accompanied by a lack of rhetoricity. Um, but I had never really come up with a great word for these. Um, and Andrew came up with the concept of obscure disabilities for this sort of condition. And I immediately loved it, so I want to be sure that people understand that's his idea, not mine. Um, <laughs> even though I think it's just in this one conference paper right now. Uh, so as I've been working on this broader theory of crypt space-time, I've begun to focus on these obscure disabilities. Because I'm finding that their very obscurity their difficulty manifesting legibly in normative time frames is one of the most debilitating things about them. So now I'm going to shift gears to kind of the second half of the talk and discuss an interview study that I've been conducting with Stephanie Kirschbaum for the last three years, almost four years now. Um, so far, we've conducted 34 interviews with disabled faculty members. And through analysis of these interviews still ongoing, we've uncovered many fascinating themes. The theme I'm focusing on today is this theme of obscurity, which characterizes not only memory and other mental disabilities, but also physical disabilities, which are, for whatever reason, difficult to explain or accommodate in academic space. <coughs> and I'm shifting to a new section, and I will signal that by drinking water. <laughs> So in my analysis of these faculty interviews, which by the way is going incredibly slowly, um, if anyone needs encouragement in terms of how slow their data analysis is, you can call me. <laughs> I've come to name yep. these manifestations of disability as unaccommodatable. This is why I liked Andrew's word better. <laughs> my word was unaccommodatable. Accommodatable disabilities are noticeably present in university spaces, although, and this is important, constantly embattled. It's not as if, if your disability is accommodatable, you have an easy, a great time. Um, but it's interesting to me that sometimes not only are you in the embattled space of being disabled, you're also in the embattled, embattled space of even trying to figure out or prove what your, what your accommodations ought to be. Unaccommodatable disabilities, which could include chemical sensitivity, dementia, various cognitive impairments, chronic illnesses, or health disparities linked to environment, race, and class, these inhabit a queerly abject kind of space, and that space is usually not noticed. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that certain disabilities can be labeled unaccommodatable in every situation, nor am I saying that certain disabilities are accommodatable and others are not. We shouldn't and can't draw clear dividing lines like that, and that's part of the point of Crip Space Time is when we try to draw those lines, we inevitably end up throwing some people under the bus. Basically, what I'm trying to argue is that disability is a metric, not a, not a condition. And I've included these examples to try to illuminate what I mean by that metric. These disabilities do not live in body minds. Rather, they are signs of what we assume body minds to be. And as I mentioned, 
when we do try to draw lines between disabilities that are this way and disabilities that are that way, we enable the creation of a dividing line. Those who, in this case, we're enabled, when we think about accommodation and what can be accommodated, we enable a dividing line between those whose disabilities are stable enough, predictable enough, to benefit from the protections of rights-based accommodation and those whose are not. And as I also mentioned, this means that inevitably some people get thrown under the bus. Now, of course, no manifestation of disability is truly predictable. Deafness, blindness, mobility impairments, any disability will fluctuate because it is emerging through space-time. A deaf participant in the study once referred to something that she called, quote, a good lip-reading day, end quote. She meant that although the audiological features of her hearing might not change from day to day, the emergent space-time in which she hears and signs, as well as her own capacities on one day as opposed to another day, do vary. However, and here's the part that I really got stuck on, some disabilities can be made to appear predictable enough in order to specify one's, as um, universities are so fond of asking for, <coughs> one's needs, quote unquote. Indeed, the structure and governance of academic access almost always mandates that we pass as predictable by requiring that our forms of access be figured out and arranged ahead of time. As the interviews that Stephanie and I have conducted have shown again and again, Managing this predictable, unpredictable paradox requires enormous emotional labor. When I talk about some of the specific examples from our interviewees, I'll talk more about how this emotional labor is carried out. Hmm. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Accommodation in university space actually shores up, rather than mitigating, the precarious position of disabled academics. In other words, accommodation itself, because it demands this predictability I've been talking about, tends to operate, in many cases, and against our will, as a mechanism of neoliberalism. The broader, more malleable concept of access, for example, that we see in Rod Machaco's work, of course works better. But accommodation and access tend to be conflated, especially when we talk about disability in academic space-time. Now, to be clear, I'm not actually against accommodations. I continue to appreciate and work toward accommodation. I also have various accommodations that are federally regulated that are given to me by my university. So I, too, am part of that system participating in it and complicit in it, even as I continue to critique it. What I am trying to argue is that the way accommodations are understood in specific times and places often leads to their being applied in limiting ways. The key is that the imaginative logic of using accommodation as a means toward access relies on the assumption that disability can be predicted. It requires the ability to say, I can tell you what I'm going to need in an hour, in a week, next semester, in a year, you know, in whatever time frame has been set up for us by the clock of academia. Predictability is, in a sense, the complement of memory. Just as a disabled understanding of memory requires that it reach through the past through experiences without ambiguity or what Plato would call deception, so does such an understanding of prediction require that we reach into the future without ambiguity, without error. Those of us who try to gain access in various environments, including higher education, have historically tended to trade upon whatever predictability we can muster or masquerade. And there I'm borrowing Tobin Siebers' concept of the disability masquerade. Unfortunately, in doing so, we have enabled the creation of the dividing line that I mentioned. Those whose disabilities are stable enough to warrant accommodation and those whose are not. To illustrate this point, I draw on a story from an interviewee named Nicola, who described having been a speaker on a panel at her school. During a break, she left the room to go to the bathroom and was a bit late returning because it took her longer to urinate than she'd expected. She described the experience like this. I have figured out that if I start to get like really anxious about it, like, oh my God, I have to pee and I can't pee. I was interviewing her and at this point I said, mm-hmm that it'll just perpetuate that like the spasm and I won't be able to go. 
So what I have to do is calm the fuck down, Margaret, mm -hmm. and just be like, <laughs> it's okay, eventually this will happen. It's a muscle. It'll, it'll relax. I can't, like, on command, just, like, empty my bladder in, like, in 15 seconds. It doesn't work that way. Continuing the story, Nicola described getting back late to the presentation room, where the session chair gave her a look she described as, quote, get your fucking ass over here <coughs> now, end quote. Reflecting on this incident, which she related as an example of something that happens to her often due to the unpredictable nature of her illness, Nicola sighed and said that people usually seem to assume that she's to blame for being late or having to leave spaces suddenly and unexpectedly. I don't think it's even occurring to them to ask, she said, why is this person late, unquote. Now, part of what's interesting to me is it's just not clear what access might look like in this situation, except in terms of understanding and empathy, a willingness to concede that bladders might not be productive on neoliberal timeframes. It's also clear that while technically Nicola could ask for and possibly even <coughs> receive the accommodation, maybe late to events without penalty. This would probably not do anything to mitigate the affective and judgmental response of those around her, nor would it mitigate the material consequences to her career. Nicola is a non-tenure track faculty member, and although the Americans with Disabilities Act guarantees equal treatment regardless of job status, this is typically not actually true for faculty in more precarious positions. Finally, it wouldn't mitigate the harm to dignity experienced by those who are not permitted to void their bladders in the way they need to. In the longer paper from, from which this talk is drawn, I show how this key theme, predictability, helps sustain the neoliberal logic that governs disability in academe. Drawing on interviews, I've identified two further categories that help define this theme, and uh, my analysis is still ongoing, so I assume I will find more. The two further themes that i found for now are these. Ambient uncertainty, or not knowing what you don't know, and second, what I call the body-mind event. Um, and these are both sub-themes under the main theme of unpredictability. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit first about uh, ambient uncertainty. Where are we at here? Oh. Uh, many of the faculty members we interviewed described the significant emotional labor required as they moved through situations in which disability and accommodation were almost never mentioned, except in a derogatory way. For example, when other faculty complained about crazy or needy students, and in which their own efforts to manage their disability identities were based upon laborious guesswork. Important to notice here is not only that disability demands a similar sort of ongoing self-surveillance, but also that intersexual considerations will complicate that labor, as when one of our interviewees noted the need to be aware that her colleagues might take her race and disability together to um, place her into the category of the, quote, stereotypical crazy Latina, end quote. This interviewee, <coughs> whose pseudonym is Zoe, described numerous events of being gaslighted and of experiences that she started to describe as microaggressions, but then revised to say, I don't want to call them microaggressions because they're pretty blatant. One of the stories that she told was this. I was asked if I might be reading into things or whether I might be blowing things out of proportion. And I know these questions come as a result of what people know about my disabilities. So here's how I see it working. <coughs> I have anxiety disorder and I worry about things a lot and how they affect me and my students. I overthink things sometimes. As a result, when I've spoken to colleagues about my concerns with one of the people harassing her, who she named, no one has been able to offer any useful advice. One person said he hadn't heard anything negative and the other person said I might just be taking things the wrong way and quote unquote reading into it. One even asked if maybe I wasn't just being a little paranoid. This sort of emotional labor is extraordinarily hard to document, in part because the reason that it might exist is itself called into question. That is, the faculty member performing the emotional labor of trying to manage ambient uncertainty will be seen from another point of view as doing no labor at all. The second sub-theme, the body-mind event, requires a little bit of explanation. I define a body-mind event as a sudden debilitating shift in one's mental slash corporeal experience. 
Examples of such events might include a panic attack, being suddenly exposed to a toxic chemical or fragrance, abruptly realizing that an interpreter is not interpreting accurately, or hitting an unseen bump with one's wheelchair and flipping over frontwards. Body minds events, like disability itself, are not located in body minds, but rather take place in space time. They arise from the particular conditions of space and time that contribute to the emergent meaning of a situation. The emotionality of experiencing such an event arises not only from the debilitating event itself, but from the fact that nearby body minds, not experiencing the event, often deny that it is actually happening. An example of a body-mind event comes from an interviewee whose pseudonym is Iris. Iris, a professor at a large research university, described her experience of a brain injury as one of what she <coughs> called, quote-unquote, disabling terror, followed by a near breakdown at work. She was untenured at the time this story took place. Although she had already disclosed and obtained accommodations for what she called her usual disability, which involves mobility, impairment, and pain, she later learned that she had a torn artery in her brain, an extremely dangerous condition which could have led to a sudden stroke or severe <coughs> brain damage. Iris described meeting with her chair and trying to explain the debilitating fear she was experiencing. My other, um, she referred to these as her other disabilities, the ones she had previously called her usual disabilities. You know, I was like, this is what's happening and I was very professional. And this time, talking about the brain injury, I was very upset and I started crying and that was really embarrassing. Even though I know it happens mm -hmm, <laughs> a lot for people in these situations. And I felt like disclosing disability that I've been living with for a long time, the mobility impairment and pain, is very different from disclosing that I'm going through a scary medical crisis. In Iris' Iris's story, the debilitating event is a future event, existing largely in terms of potential, but no less material for that. In present time, Iris said, quote, I don't have symptoms from it. It's not physically debilitating me, but it's terrifying, end quote. The labor associated with managing this kind of disablement is, like the labor described in the previous section, largely ambient and emotional. It can be hard to get others to understand the materiality of this sort of labor, and hence to consider it serious or real enough for accommodation. In the disabled faculty study, a number of interviewees with multiple disabilities reported requesting accommodations on the basis of whichever one of the disabilities seemed most acceptable or most understandable. For example, discussing diabetes rather than bipolar disorder or explaining the needs surrounding a mobility impairment rather than those surrounding chronic pain or addiction. Um, this strategy has been, defined, has been identified by Tara Wood as selective disclosure. Um, and Tara Wood did a um, very broad-based study of college students um, and their experiences with the accommodations they received. And that was one of her findings, is that college students disclosing disability, um, if they have multiple disabilities, they will often disclose the one that seems like it will best get the job done, basically. They don't necessarily disclose all their disabilities or offer um, what we might think of as complete information, because they're sort of doing it on a more transactional way and, of course, protecting themselves in every way they can. Uh, Iris emphasized her awareness of her ability to appeal to physical debilitation. She explained, quote, with every step of the way, I would say that the fact I have a physical disability, a medically validated physical disability, has smoothed the way for me, end quote. Thus, although Iris spoke eloquently at her interview about the ways her brain injury was a body-mind event, not an event of the body or the mind. She was also candid about the fact that she often treated it as a physical event for the purposes of accommodation. So that's the end of the data I'm presenting today. Um, and I want to just wrap up by saying that, um, once again, I started with um, thinking through memory and the ways that it's entangled with emotion, but it led me to this thinking about the ways that a wide range of disabilities, these obscure disabilities, are entangled with emotion in very complicated ways. And often a great deal of labor associated with being disabled in this way is the emotional labor, which in turn is all the more laborious because the emotional labor is unseen by those around us and may even, we may even be told that it's not actually happening. 
Um, and this is one of the lines of thought and analysis that has led me to the theory of crypt space-time. Because I've come to realize with increasing certainty that when one is performing this kind of emotional labor, when one is moving as a crypt in these ways, one is not in the same space-time as the other people in one's situation, or often is not. One is often actually occupying a different space-time where things happen at a different pace, cost more, um, have different repercussions, a world that is completely illegible and typically unknown to those around us as we perform our various forms of labor. Um, I also want to mention one striking finding from the interview study. Only a few faculty out of the four mentioned difficulty with memory and cognitive issues, and almost none of these faculty spoke about it in depth. When asked to expand, actually, several of the faculty members who had this particular issue of memory impairment asked that that information not be included in their interview. They took it all the way off the table. This confirms Kendall Phillips's discussion of memory and indicates to me that it would seem that memory is quite a dangerous topic indeed. Thank you.